All right, so David, over to you. Thank you so much, Allison, and uh, thank you everybody for being with us here this evening. We are extremely lucky uh, to be joined by this, this group of uh, scholars um, for the Laurel Cemetery Memorial Project. Uh, and the mission of the Laurel Cemetery Memorial Project is to erect a permanent memorial in recognition of the thousands of African Americans who were laid to rest at the historic Laurel Cemetery off Bel Air Road to ensure the safety and stability of the site into the foreseeable future and to educate the public about the rich history of the cemetery and the lives of those buried there. You're joining us this evening to learn the history of the cemetery, exciting research and plans for the memorial. Partners in this effort include Coppin State University, University of Baltimore, and the Agnes Kane Callum Baltimore chapter of the African American Historical and Genealogical Society. And our panelists will be Laurel Cemetery Memorial Project leaders, historians and researchers, Elgin Klug, Glenn Blackwell, Donna Tyler Holly, Ronald Costanzo, and Isaac Schoen. Um, and I will give a, a quick bio of all of those folks. Um, so I'll run through that here. Glenn Blackwell serves as the Vice President of Genealogy for the Baltimore African American, Afro American Historical and Genealogical Society. Additionally, leads the effort uh, to identify Laurel Cemetery burials reported in Baltimore City Death Certificates. Ronald Costanzo is an Associate Dean in the Yale Gordon College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Baltimore, an archeologist who's worked on issues involving the archeology span of African-Americans for the last two decades, including this investigation. Donna Tyler Holly is a native Baltimorean, retired professor of history and social science at Sojourner Douglas College and a charter member and vice president for the Baltimore chapter of the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society, also co-founder and vice president of Heritage Associates, a firm specializing in historical and genealogical research. Elgin Klug is an associate professor in the Department of Applied Social and Political Sciences at Coppin State. Dr. Klug received his training in applied anthropology at the University of South Florida, where he became interested in issues related to heritage and community development. He serves as chair of the project. And finally, Isaac Schoen earned his PhD at the University of Florida, is an adjunct professor at the University of Baltimore and Coppin State. Apart from this project, his research focuses primarily on the archeology span and ethno history of the Caribbean and South America. So as you can tell, we have an amazing uh, slate of folks and I don't wanna waste any more time uh, with you hearing from me. Um, so with all that said, uh, I am going to uh, get this started by kicking it to uh, Elgin Klug. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us to be able to present and share our work with the Laurel Cemetery Project. Um, we, are, we, re we represent the Laurel Cemetery Memorial Project. We have been a group meeting since uh, August 2019. So let me go ahead and start my screen so I can show you a couple pictures. All right. Are you seeing my PowerPoint? Or did I do something too quick? You see it, yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So yes, we came together first as the Laurel Cemetery Memorial Task Force in August 2019 as a result of the symposium that we held on Laurel Cemetery back in uh, earlier in 2019, June 15th on the campus of Coppin State University. The idea there was to share our research widely with the public. We had been, we had just completed the archeology span and we wanted to roll into phase two of our project, which was engaging the public and letting people know what we found and also wanting to make sure that we left a permanent mark on the landscape, how we wanted to see how we could create a kind of memorial for the cemetery at, in the current space where there's nothing to signify the existence of a, any burials right now. So over time, over the last couple of years, we have formed ourselves into a 501c3 organization so that we could be eligible for funding. And we are, the recipients of an African-American Heritage Preservation Program grant from the Maryland Historical Trust and the Maryland Commission on African-American History and Culture. 
And that money will help us bring to fruition the idea of building a memorial at the site. And David shared with you our mission, but our mission chiefly is to erect a permanent memorial in recognition of the thousands of African-Americans buried at historic Laurel Cemetery. And to make sure that that is something that can stay in place in perpetuity. The general history. I, I, at this point, I, the self-selected group of individuals observing this particular presentation may already have some basic knowledge about Laurel Cemetery, but sometimes we do encounter individuals who've not heard of this place before. Um, Laurel Cemetery was incorporated in 1852 in East Baltimore as a non-sectarian cemetery for African-Americans. So this was a very large site dedicated for burials for African-American individuals. Um, it was a premier burial site for fo folks across Black Baltimore's socioeconomic spectrum. Um, it was in many ways seen as a, an African-American answer to Greenmount Cemetery. Uh, there's an unknown number of the total burials. When we first got involved in this research, my idea of a, a of reaching for an estimate, I thought maybe there might be more than 10,000 burials or so forth. We have, uh, when what we've uncovered and what will be shared with you in terms of the death certificate transcription project, we have far surpassed 10,000 already and anticipate to uh, get much even higher than the 20,000 is estimated on this slide. Um, Lowell Cemetery thrived in its first 50 or 60 so years, but by the 1920s, the, the care of the, of the property started to decline. And by the 1940s, it had become a eyesore and uh, many in the local neighborhood saw it as a, a nuisance because of the improper maintenance. And eventually it was demolished in 1958, despite legal challenges. That was interesting to uncover. People fought to stop the demolition of this cemetery. The NAACP got involved. Uh, Juanita Jackson Mitchell was one of the lawyers, but they ultimately were not successful in fighting to stop the demolition of this cemetery. So where is it? Many of you will be familiar with the landscape of Baltimore. You might know where Baltimore Cemetery is at the east end of North Avenue. Um, if you're going towards Baltimore Cemetery and you take that last left turn, that's Bel Air Road, and you end up passing Lowell Cemetery on the right. It's directly across the street from Clifton Park. On this map says that that area we know as Clifton Park is slated here on this map as the grounds of the Johns Hopkins University. It's interesting to note that that was the original intent at, at some point for what this that space was to be used for instead of the, the golf courses there now. That space is st still there, but it, the exact footprint of the cemetery is occupied by the current Bel Air Edison Shopping Crossing, excuse me, Bel Air Edison Shopping Center. I think it's called the Bel Air Edison Crossing Shopping Center. Um, people know about the Food Depot store and the Foreman Mills store. This, this is a widely used, heavily traveled shopping center. But what we have found is that under that parking lot and in the small amount of green space at this shopping center are likely thousands of burials. This is a picture from around 1948 showing the condition of the cemetery and the, the lack of perpetual care and maintenance. Even if an individual family wanted to go take care of their family plot, they would have had a hard time just trying to get into the property and navigate any road that they could possibly even see to get to the plot to try to clear out vegetation. So it really got into an unworkable state. Here's a picture from Baltimore Sun in 1958 showing the, the demolition of the cemetery. Um, officially, the cemetery was moved to a Carroll County site in Johnsville, the Johnsville Freedom District to the, the new Laurel Cemetery site. But it was said that around only 15,000 or more dollars was used for that relocation. We're talking about thousands of burials. So that's- um, Man, 
pretty interesting right there to think that you could have moved that many burials for that little bit of a price. And you see the the, memor the, the headstones basically being loaded into the dump truck. Several, about 600 or so stones were taken up to Carroll County and neatly placed in rows. But it, it seems evident from this picture that not all of them probably made it to Carroll County or, or were taken um, care of in any con with, with any consideration. Um, just as a, a quick aside, I was talking last night about another cemetery site called the Columbian Harmony Cemetery in DC. That was also a cemetery that was incorporated in, 18, in the 1850s and demolished in the 1950s. It was a public, a non-sectarian cemetery for African-Americans, had 37,000 documented burials. They spent a million dollars moving the burials from that cemetery to the new Harmony Cemetery site in Landover or in Prince George's County, Maryland. And still they didn't, they moved the burials and just put them all in a mass grave and still didn't take the headstones. So they didn't do a complete job for a million dollars in DC. So you can imagine what kind of job was done for just a little over $15,000 in Baltimore. This is just the aerial view of the current Bel Air Edison Shopping Center. Um, and we're gonna talk about archeology, span but what I wanted to show you first, just to make you aware, briefly, is that we released our project newsletter today. So I have dropped this in the chat. Everybody has this to, to um, be able to download and look at, but I, I ask that you please uh, download the newsletter. And if uh, you want to be added to our mailing list, please go ahead and email the, the Remember Laurel Cemetery at Yahoo dot com address that's provided on the newsletter. In each newsletter, we're gonna have a feature story. Uh, this one, since it's our first issue, talks about the, the beginnings of our project and talks about the initial archeological research that got us going. We're gonna have biological profiles in each of these issues. This one profiles Reverend Harvey Johnson and his wife, Amelia Etta Hall Johnson. We're gonna provide updates on our research regarding the death certificate transcription project. We're also gonna provide updates on our presentation and outreach efforts and some information on other African-American cemetery sites and the similar work that they're doing. So just wanna let you know that that's available, but for right now, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen and turn the podium over to my colleague, Dr. Ron Costanzo, who will take you on an exploration of the archeological parts of, of this research that were really the beginnings of this entire project. Thank you. All right, thanks, Elgin. Yeah, let me um, share my screen. Hopefully, y'all can see that. Um, the the phase one, the product was the archaeological field work. Uh, it had three goals. One was, and the primary goal was to determine if the the Bell or Edison Crossing Shopping Center is actually a burial, burial, burial ground still today. That was our number one goal. Another goal was to get students um, archeological uh, um, research experience. We had created an anthropology track in one of our programs at the University of Baltimore and, and to get students some experience. But also um, it was a collaborative effort. So we wanted to bring students together from different institutions, Principal University of Baltimore and Coppin State University, but also some other um, institutions in the region. Um, um, Community College of Baltimore County, Essex, uh, campus. We had students from there do a significant amount of work, for example. Um, this um, is a satellite image, but it overlaid is the, the field work that we did. Um, you can see up in the upper left-hand corner at the northern edge of the shopping center here in this kind of grassy field in the upper part. You can probably see my, my arrow here. Um, it's kind of our area of interest up in here. But we did six excavations in total, A through F. You can see them in red here. Also, we did two um, very limited uh, um, surveys using ground penetrating radar, which you can see in kind of this uh, um, violet dashed here, one um, set of transects in this green space here, the other one in the, the parking lot 
itself, some transects there. This is some photographs of the area um, of interest. Uh, one, there, there was, was a broken tombstone there that was uh, um, jutting from the surface, which, which was an early clue that, yeah, the cemetery was in fact there, aside from uh, the shopping center occupying virtually precisely the same footprint as the, the cemetery, the old cemetery. But also you can see here as well that um, in these two shots, this is right, this is Bel Air Road right here, kind of looking up from Bel Air Road down here in the lower left up to the up to the parking lot. Um, erosion has become a significant issue there. I mean, more on this later when we talk about the plans for memorial, but it's become a, a, a significant issue. Um, we could even the few years we we're out there in our field work, we could see this area of erosion advancing just in that time. And I don't, I don't think there's much doubt that in not too many years you will start to have burials eroding out from this area if nothing is done to shore up that that hillside there. Um, student volunteers um, uh, from local institutions, I said, were, were, um, were used in this. A lot, of, a lot of the work was done in summertime, but also during the school year, just as part of class projects, learning exercises for, for students. Mapping um, was done using a total station. Archaeological excavation, as I said, when six, six different units um, was performed. Magnetometry. Uh, magnetometry is a kind of a remote sensing technique. It's a way to look at subsurface remains without disturbing the surface. Uses just uh, identifies anomalies in the Earth's magnetic field. Wasn't of great utility for us in the end. Probably not all that surprising. There's a lot of steel right around there. You can see cars right in the distance there, and Bel Air Road is right there. So magnetometry is probably not the best technique to use there. But again, uh, these things were, a lot of these things were conceived as class projects, introducing students to different kinds of techniques. Um, now, ground penetrating radar was used to great effect there. Um, it's just a technique that, uh, through which um, the instrument propagates radio waves into the ground, and it passes through certain substances, at varying speeds depending on the property of the substrate. Also, certain things are, it doesn't pass through, and, and it creates a reflection and an image can be created. So using the raw data software creates an image. This is one kind of image that's created, a, what they call a slice. And this is an area down in that green space there, that grassy area. And you can see these, these parabola here, along here, these are reflections. Okay, so the, the surface is up above here. So this is kind of like a cross section almost, like a profile, you know, somebody would be, walking across here, like theoretically we're up on this surface. And many of these you see here are probably reflective of burials. Now we decide to excavate right here in this ground, right above this area where I've, you know, um, uh, with this yellow oval, an area we look at a really particularly dense area. These aren't the really the cleanest reflections that you might expect from burials, but I think there's a really good reason for that, which we'll, which we'll get to in just, just a minute. So this area, which actually was unit E, um, here we are excavating it. That's right, right where that yellow, above where that yellow oval was. Because the initial uh, thought was that the cemetery was really virtually entirely destroyed. Um, and, and the reports and that it was moved and, and it was bulldozing. We have photos of the bulldozing taking place. So um, the idea was, well, um, it's probably largely destroyed. If we're going to find burials, they might be commingled, maybe perhaps in this green space area. Um, but it, it became clear after our first season that didn't seem to be what we're collecting in the field. The information we're gathering didn't seem to match that that hypothesis. Now, this particular um, excavation here, um, we discovered uh, perhaps about 50 centimeters down, not that far down from the surface, um, a lot of uh, garbage that dated looked like to the 1940s and 50s, which made sense. We know that by the 1940s and 50s, it was very overgrown. We know from reports that garbage they began dumping garbage at the site. Garbage trucks would show up and dump garbage at the site. So it's probably not all that surprising that you would see garbage in one of our levels. Now, we also discovered though here, evidence of burials. Um, and this include hardware from caskets or coffins. Um, you could see handles here. In fact, there's still um, some wood 
and some of these metal handles, um, some decorative pieces here, nails uh, from caskets. This is what one appeared in this um, in this unit, this excavation unit. Really, this is an advanced stage of decomposition. Um, this casket slash coffin. Um, 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 the the walls and the floor of it appear kind of just as a thin lens of really darkened soil, you know, with a lot of organic material. It's most of how how it appears. Um, we did find some pieces of wood remaining, but there was very little of that left in that particular area. You see some pieces here that we recovered. There are actually some white paint on these. And also in the wall of that unit, we discovered um, next to it um, remains of a casket, clearly a casket in this, in this instant, instance, and not in quite as advanced stage of decomposition. And uh, you can see the walls are kind of grown through with roots. It almost... Um, um, takes on the appearance of a woven basket, really. And you can see some of the handles here. This one had a prop here that kind of flopped off. You can kind of see the scar of it right here. And I propped it there for the purposes of, of the picture. This one's still kind of attached. But virtually all the handles were kind of in place on this. We did um, um, ex uh, um, excavate one more unit here right above where this casket was. Now, also what we found in unit E um, was were two human long bones, small fragments of long, long bone. One was recovered in fragments, the other was more or less whole, but both were grown through um, by roots, which were kind of splitting them. So this was our uh, really um, first evidence of actual human remains at the site. Um, we decided for one more excavation unit just to the north of that to explore that casket that was in the wall, just to give us a better central density of the remains at the site. Now, um, what we discovered in that, which was would become unit F, um, was that there were at least two caskets stacked up on top of each other. We ceased our excavation at the second uh, casket, okay? Um, because we had really answered our question, um, we, don't, we didn't want to continue disturbing burials. We had already disturbed a few in this one location. Um, we answered our basic question that there are remains there. And from the looks of it, from our survey in both the grassy area and the parking lot, probably a relatively high density, probably a lot of the barrels, although in an advanced stage of decomposition, they're actually probably largely intact. It's likely that under where the shopping center, itself for the food depot, for example, in that strip mall there, it's likely they were completely obliterated in that location. They graded the land there. Um, Elgin had a photo of what it looks like behind that shopping center. They clearly moved a, a lot of earth, moved a lot of earth from that location. So it's lucky they are very much destroyed. But under the line share of what was the old cemetery, they're very likely still there. The barrows are very likely still there, not what I was originally thinking. I actually approached this, this project. And again, I, I mentioned the GPR and the, um, the image. I think that why you have this not the cleanest looking um, 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 burials in the image is because you probably do have a lot of stacking and a lot of tightly clustered burials. Um, um, and that's probably what, what, what explains that. Um, now, phase two. Phase two was in, in engaging the public. Um, uh, the first um, step of that was educating the public about the existence of the burials. And this involved a number of things. Uh, video was produced by Elgin in conjunction with Towson University, a student from Towson, Towson if I'm remembering correctly. Um, that was put on YouTube and posted on a number of Facebook sites. Also, we had a symposium um, that, that Elgin mentioned in June of 2019, that was part of this. Uh, um, and what grew out of that, formed out of that was the task force that Elgin mentioned. Um, and, and which was aimed with constructing a memorial at the site, educating the public um, and some other elements. Now, the next step also in this was the research. And for this, I'm gonna turn it over to Glenn, Glenn Blackwell. Um, let me stop sharing my screen. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I turn it over to Glenn. Okay, I'm going to need an assist from someone because I don't have a screen to share. So, uh, oh, okay, hold on, Glenn. Let me, okay. let me put mine back up there again, and you can All tell right. me when to advance. Okay. 
Hold on a second. Let me bring this back up. All right. And you can okay. tell me when to advance the slides. Okay. Thanks, Ron. Um, is this mine? Uh, next. Okay. Uh, so good, e good evening, everyone. Ron, you go to the next slide. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm the vice president of genealogy for what we call Lovingly Boggs, the Baltimore Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society, Agnes Kane Callum chapter. It was founded more than 30 years ago, and we're part of a national organization. We have about 25 active members, and prior to um, the pandemic, we met the first Saturday of each month at um, Enoch Pratt Northwood Branch. Next. And Box is involved with a lot of different um, community activities. So um, prior to the pandemic, we taught high school students at Mervo High School how to do family and community history research. Um, that was um, an interesting project, and we had had plans to do one at Douglas High School as well, but that was postponed due to the pandemic. So hopefully we'll be able to resume that in the next year or two. Uh, there was also a Lincoln Bible history project um, towards the end of the Civil War, and I'm sorry I don't have the, the exact dates, but um, a group of African Americans in Baltimore collected money to purchase a Bible for Abraham Lincoln and presented to him as uh, a thanks for his efforts in uh, emancipating African Americans. We've all, our members have also volunteered at the Maryland State Archives, either have or are still volunteering at the Maryland State Archives, the Baltimore City Archives, the Reginald F. Lewis Museum, the Baltimore County Historical Society, um, and others. We also had a project a number of years ago um, at the Western Star Cemetery transcribing the burials there, uh, and then currently the Laurel Cemetery project. Next. So we had a meeting of our officers in the summer of 2018 and the topic of the Laurel Cemetery came up and there were a couple of us that um, just mentioned Laurel Cemetery and that we had either family members or ancestors who were buried at Laurel. And we said that would be a great project for, for Boggs to be, involved with, to be involved in. It was a natural fit for us. And so obviously nowadays, the first thing you do is you Google it and immediately came up with the um, YouTube clip um, of Elgin Clue and Ron Costanzo's efforts. And so we reached out to uh, Dr. Clue and we met with him shortly thereafter and we began the conversation about how we could collaborate because there was a lot to do and there was mutual interest. Next. One of our members, Eva Slezak, um, who I'm not sure if she's still at the Pratt, but she had been um, an employee at the Enoch Pratt Central Library for I think around 50 years. And she had worked with some people that had done um, some work on um, the Laurel Cemetery gathering information. And so she said, give her a little time. She said, she's got some things at home and she brought them in. So she had copies of a lot of different articles, uh, some photos, a number of other things. And so from there, we also started uh, using ProQuest um, to research the Sun Paper and the Afro archives. And we found yet more information. And so at that point, our focus moved towards the interred. Who exactly was buried at Laurel Cemetery? And we began to compile info on a spreadsheet. Um, we also found additional information uh, from various um, Boggs members records, findagrave.com, the Coalition to, to Protect Maryland Burial Sites and other sources. So by using those methods early on, we were able to find more than 500 burials at uh, Laurel through these methods. Next, please. But what we also knew is that we needed to access the death certificates at the Maryland State Archives. And Maryland began requiring death certificates in Baltimore um, in 1875, January 1st, 1875. Um, and we had a number of members that were interested in volunteering um, to go through those death certificates to uh, you know, compile records on the burials at, 
at Laurel Cemetery, but a number of them didn't have transportation. Um, and then those that did, you lose a lot of time driving from Baltimore to Annapolis to transcribe those records. So we needed to find something that would work better, you know, to to uh, get over that hurdle of the travel distance from Baltimore to Annapolis uh, to search those death certificate records. So what we did was we approached the then chief archivist at the Maryland State Archives, Tim Baker, and also Rob Schoberlein, uh, who is still the current archivist at the Baltimore City Archives, um, to ask them to present them, you know, the information about our dilemma and see if they could help. And they got back to us in probably two weeks tops. And they said, well, what we can do is we can make those death certificate records, which are only, which were only available at the Baltimore City, I'm sorry, at the Maryland State Archives, available to you at the Baltimore City Archives, which is over uh, not too far from Greenmount and 29th Street. And so, uh, you know, the members that did not have cars were able to catch the bus and walk a short distance to the, Maryland, to the Baltimore City Archives. And, um, you know, they also provided us with a number of laptops and desktops so that we could use those for our members also. Um, so we really appreciated their support for um, the project and how quickly they acted to assist us. Uh, next, please. So what we had to decide was, okay, what are we going to include? What information are we going to gather in this transcription process? And the death certificates changed many times over the years from 1875 to 1958, when Laurel was um, condemned and demolished. And so we tried to keep in mind what, the, what a number of the end users might be interested in. And so with that in mind, we decided to compile the death certificate number, date of death, full name of the decedent, the gender, race, color, marital status, the name of the spouse, age of death, place of death, years in Baltimore, cause of death. Next, please. <clears throat> the father's name, the mother's maiden name if available, their occupation, uh, their date of burial, the informant's name, the undertaker mortician's name and business address, the last resident, uh, other relatives mentioned and other pertinent information. And as we go through it, and we can't get too deep into that today, but all of those categories are um, revealing in a number of different ways. Um, the causes of death, they were um, diseases that we think nothing of today that modern medicine can treat easily. Um, a lot of the places where they live no longer exist. So we were able to um, document different communities and where a number of streets used to be that have been demolished. Um, so a lot of information uh, like that. Also with undertakers, there are a number of undertakers where the husband may have been the initial undertaker slash mortician. And then once he passed, the wife took over and the uh, undertaker would be listed as Mrs. So-and-so. Uh, next, please. Okay, so um, with those categories in mind, we tried to keep in mind some of the primary uses that we thought might be interested, genealogists, family historians, local historians, uh, students, future researchers, and there were a number of uh, transcription challenges. Uh, primarily, or one, of the, one of the main ones is uh, reading that old handwriting. Um, because it wasn't unusual for there to be uh, three different people that, that made entries onto a given death certificate. So you not only had to read old handwriting, but you had to read various samples of it. Um, also spelling was a challenge because I believe at that time when uh, Laurel opened, there weren't uh, public schools in Baltimore, um, at least not to the extent where uh, public education was widely available. Next, please. So this is just a photo of some of our volunteers and collaborators operating at the Baltimore City Archives. Um, and we, we've had a good group of people over the years. Next, please. So this is just a small sample of um, some of the people that were buried at Laurel. 
This death certificate is of um, a young boy by the name of John the Baptist. Next, please. This death certificate is of a man by the name of Thomas L. Lewis, who was um, listed as colored, born in London, England, and his occupation was as a, was a seaman. And he died of uh, thysis pulmonalis, which is uh, a form of tuberculosis. Next, please. Henry Jenkins, a man that was born in Kentucky who was an herb doctor. Next, please. Daniel uh, Newman, who was a US soldier um, and died from an abscess uh, that he received from being injured by an Indian arrow. So there's a good chance we haven't um, gone to the National Archives to research his uh, military history, but there's a good chance that he was a Buffalo soldier. Next, please. Hester Presbury, who was said to be about 125 years when she died. And it was interesting because one of our uh, last in-person presentations, there was an individual in the audience uh, who knew some of the Presbury family members that lived in Harford County where Hester Presbury was born. And um, he remarked, he said, those Presburys are long livers. He said, they live a long time. Uh, next, please. It's one of my personal favorites, Isabella Alice, who died at the age of 101 and six months and her birthplace was reported as Africa. Next, please. So the future of the transcription project, uh, we lost a lot of time due to COVID. We had to shut down our operation essentially for a year, year and a half. Um, prior to COVID, we had 12 volunteers actively researching. Now we're back up to between six and eight active volunteers. Uh, we had researched 148 death certificates at that time. Um, and we had found at that time almost uh, 12,000 laurel interments. Uh, I checked a little earlier today and we're over 17,700. Um, and I think we're only a, a, roughly a quarter of the way through the death certificate reels from 1875 to 1958. Uh, a, last, a master list will be made public in the near future. And we also have a, a webpage on ancestry of a Laurel Cemetery family tree. So we're hoping to post some names there and maybe get some links to people um, who have some ancestors that were buried at Laurel and maybe find out more information about those people that were interred there. Now, one of the, the, the big things is that since Laurel opened in 1852 and death certificates weren't required in Baltimore City until 1875, we've got a good 23 years there where there are a number of burials um, and we essentially will have very, very little information on the people that were interred there. One indication that, that may give us uh, some idea of the number of people that were buried there from 1852 to 1874 is that in the years from 1875 mm -hmm. to about 1879, 1880, there were approximately a thousand burials per year. Um, so that kind of indicates that Laurel was very popular early on and there were probably thousands of burials at Laurel between 1852 and 1874 that we'll just never know about. Next, please. So with the transcription pro project, uh, we've only scratched the surface. We've got a long way to go. We'll probably do be doing this for um, a number of years. Um, if you have a free weekday, um, we would love to have anyone that's interested come to join us to help with the transcription project. We have it situated now um, with the help of the Baltimore City Archives, the Maryland State Archives, and the former chief archivist, Ed, Ed Papenfuse at the uh, Maryland State Archives, where um, you can do a lot of this from home now. So if you're interested, I can meet you there to kind of show you um, um, you know, show you the ropes, show you what we do, how we do it and um, you know, get you started if you're interested. So you can contact me at Glenn Blackwell at verizon.net if you're interested. And that's about it, thank you.
Good evening, everyone. Can I get some help, Mr. Costanza? Sure, you want me to continue, continue sharing my um, screen? Yes, that would be great, thank you. Sure. Okay. Glenn, you wanna finish up? I'm sorry, Glenn, I thought you were finished. I thought he might want to read his quote about um, from Lily Carroll Jackson. Oh, okay. I can. Yes, please. Okay. Laurel Cemetery had some of the finest Baltimoreans and Marylanders as ever put into being. Some of the finest ministers, finest doctors, finest lawyers, finest school teachers, men and women who we honor in the city of Baltimore. Men who walked the streets of Baltimore, women who walked the streets of Baltimore with dignity and help to make Baltimore a better place for us to live today. Okay, thank you. Next. That describes what I'm about to discuss with you this evening. Um, I've researched some of the people buried in Laurel Cemetery, some accomplished and well-known, some not so accomplished and not so well-known, but really representing a microcosm of the African-American community, <clears throat> excuse me, in Baltimore City. And we use basically standard research um, methodologies, census, ancestry, family search, find a grave. Google's always helpful, always used, um, also use city directories. People from our um, genealogical group brought in obituaries of family members buried in Laurel Cemetery. And we used newspaper obituaries and articles and also interviewed people who knew about family members who had been buried at the cemetery. Next, please. So I just wanna discuss a few of them. And one of my favorites is John William Locks, 1818 to 1884. <clears throat> he was born to free parents in Baltimore City and he started off life pretty well. His father had been a, uh, a drayman and left him and his siblings houses, uh, three pieces of property in Fells Point. Apprenticed his son, John, to a carpenter and John started a livery and hack business by 1850, he owned five houses on Wolf Street, and they're still in existence today. He started the Locks Funeral Home in East Baltimore, which was operated by seven generations of his family. And he was the co-founder, president, and largest shareholder of the first African-American-owned shipyard in the country. He was a representative for African-American Republicans at the 1880. 1880 National Convention, and one of three first African Americans to serve on a federal grand jury in Baltimore. He was a trustee of what is now Bowie State University, and he advocated for most of his life for African American teachers in African American schools, as he believed that um, white teachers did not see the potential in African American students and therefore didn't challenge and encourage them. He was an active member of Bethel AME Church for 25 years. And when he passed, Bishop Levi Jackson Coppin was his eulogist. According to the Cleveland Gazette, there were 115 carriages in his funeral procession to Laurel Cemetery. And he was called the richest colored citizen in Baltimore. Frederick Douglass had been a childhood friend and Douglass and his daughter attended according to the Sun Papers, John Locke's um, funeral services. Dr. Patricia Locke Schmoke is the third great granddaughter of John William Locke's. Next, please. Amelia Etta Hall Johnson was born and educated in Canada. Her parents had been emancipated living in Maryland, but in response to the 1850s, 1850 Fugitive Slave Act, they fled to Canada and that's where she was born. She returned to Baltimore with her parents after the Civil War and married the Reverend Harvey Johnson, who I'll talk about a little bit later. She authored a monthly literary journal and she published an African-American history magazine for children. She also wrote three novels 
and wrote and published religious themed poems. And she was militant in her support for equality for African-Americans. Next. Which made her the perfect wife for the Reverend Harvey Johnson, who was born enslaved in Virginia, Fauquier County, Virginia. And he pastored Union Baptist Church for over 50 years. He mentored many pastors and there are still African-American Baptist churches in Baltimore today that he was responsible for encouraging new ministers to start. He sued railroad company and a passenger boat because of uh, racial discrimination. They wanted him to move to what he considered inferior quarters and he wouldn't do that. He also assisted financially members of his church who had offered, also suffered suffered discrimination. And he was active in the fight for civil rights and political and legal equality. He was a participant along with W.E.B. Du Bois in the Niagara Movement. And he founded a Baltimore organization called the Mutual United Brotherhood of Liberty, which is the forerunner of the Baltimore chapter of the NAACP, which was one of the most active chapters in the country. Next, one of the people that uh, Reverend Johnson mentored was William Moncure Alexander from Fredericksburg, Virginia. He was born free, not enslaved, and he was valedictorian of his class at Whalen Seminary in DC. Um, he started three newspapers in Baltimore, The Voice, The Home Protector, and The Afro-American, which was purchased by the Murphy family and continues in existence today. He's also a founder of the Lot Carey Baptist Foreign Missionary Convention, as were most of the men of that era. He was active in Republican politics. He served as secretary of the Mutual United Brotherhood of Liberty, and he's the founder of Sharon Baptist Church, which continues to exist today on the corner of Pressman and Stricker Streets in the Sandtown Winchester neighborhood. He encouraged his members to go into business for themselves. He wanted them to rent stalls in Lafayette Market and sell fresh vegetables to their neighbors. Next, please. Mary Lindsay Credit was born free prior to emancipation and her husband passed, leaving her with 12 children. She managed to raise those children. She assumed control of her husband's teamsters business. She taught Sunday school. She owned and operated a grocery store employing neighborhood people to work there. By 1900, she had paid off the mortgage on her home and she owned more property than any other African-American female in Baltimore. And she's the great grandmother of musician Cab Calloway. Next. George W. Kennard, born free in Baltimore, graduated from college in Pennsylvania. He established a hospital in East Baltimore in 1885, a few years ahead of Johns Hopkins. He also had a medical and nursing school at the hospital, which were accredited by the state of Maryland. He operated a primary school at, in which Greek and Hebrew were several of the subjects taught. He established and pastored a church and believed in faith healing. So he was really practicing holistic medicine because he was concerned about his patients spiritually and physically. Next, please. Daniel Alexander Payne, the sixth bishop of the AME Church was born free in South Carolina and has started a school there at the age of 19, which he had to give up because of opposition to African-Americans uh, becoming educated. He did later attend a, a seminary and became the first African-American ordained as a Lutheran minister. He's also the first African-American co college president and he was really active through Wilberforce University, helping slaves escape to Canada. He left the Lutheran Church and joined the AME Church in 1841. And when transferred to Baltimore, he was a pastor at Bethel AME, and he also organized Ebenezer AME, which continues to exist today. Next. 
Another bishop in the AME Church was Alexander Walker Wayman, who was born free in Caroline County. He was educated by his father, who was a property owner in the area where they lived. He joined AME Church in 1840, and I admire this about him. He traveled south during the Civil War, starting AME churches. I think for a free black man to travel south during the Civil War for anything took a great deal of courage. He was awarded a, a doctorate of divinity from Howard University in 1877 and spent the remainder of his career researching and writing histories of African Methodist Episcopal ministers. Next, please. Royston Blackwell, an ancestor of Glenn Blackwell. He was born enslaved in Virginia and he was freed by the Union troops passing through. He also later served in the Coast Guard for which he earned a pension. By 1879, he was in Baltimore. He was a registered voter. He had purchased, a, purchased his own home. He was operating a grocery store. Prior to Harvey Johnson's arrival at Union Baptist, uh, Mr. Blackwell was a lay preacher and deacon there. He fathered 29 children by two wives, and he managed to reunite most of his family. Some of them had died during slavery. Some had probably been sold away, but he made countless trips between um, his Northumberland County in Virginia and Baltimore to reunite his children and family and bring them all here. Next. Louisa Carroll Squirrel was born free in Baltimore. Um, I'm interested in finding out if she has any connection to any of the Carrolls who were large slave owners, but I haven't done that yet. She worked as a laundress and she was literate and by age 16 had opened a bank account in the Savings Bank of Baltimore. She was with her meager earnings as a laundress making charitable donations. She contributed to the uh, Lincoln Bible project that Glenn mentioned earlier. And there was a home in Baltimore for orphan children of union veterans. And she was a regular contributor to that. She was married to the Reverend Robert Squirrel, who was um, a Methodist minister who had left the Methodist church and joined Bethel AME. And she was the mother of five children. Next. So what have I learned from researching these people? Baltimore's African-American community was very mobile. If you read newspapers like the Afro, you'll find people traveling all up and down the Eastern seaboard. They had various occupations of unsatiable thirst for knowledge. They were active in fraternal and religious groups and pursued all the political advantages that they could. Next, please. They traveled to Philadelphia, New York, and Virginia primarily for religious and political meetings, but also visiting relatives. You can see examples in the Afro of people uh, having relatives from out of town coming to stay with them. Also, because of our location at the, at the edge of the water, you will find a lot of sailors here. And so there were a lot of people coming from all over the world to this area. Next, please. A variety of occupations. And these are people not just in Baltimore City, but people in Laurel. So you had privy cleaners, laundresses, caulkers, teachers, ministers, businessmen of all kinds. And a lot of these people had to make great sacrifice to even afford a plot in Laurel Cemetery. Next, please. Thirst for knowledge. What's missing? Many of the uh, churches in Baltimore, for example, St. James Episcopal, Bethel AME, and Sharon Baptist all had schools prior to the opening of public schools in Baltimore City. And then there were several individuals that operated um, private schools for people in the city as well. Next. Next. Okay. 
Oh, I, I do want to mention that both Bishop Daniel Payne and Reverend Harvey Johnson argued for an educated clergy. They did not believe that you could just be called to preach. You had to also be educated. Next. And most of the people in the community that I researched were in favor of African-American teachers in African-American schools for reasons I mentioned earlier. Next. They sought other sources of knowledge other than formal education as well. Next. And some of those, they, some of their other sources of knowledge came from fraternal activities. I found that a lot of people did not just belong to one fraternal group, they belonged to three, four, five. I don't know how they ever had a chance to be at home because they must have been always going to meetings. But one of the things that, um, and I interviewed a gentleman who was a member of at least four of these groups, and he told me that with his third grade education and participation in fraternal activities, he was able to learn how to read, write, and understand contracts and how to do things, um, complicated forms of negotiation. Next. As I said, multiple memberships they also joined for fellowship and emotional support, especially in times of crisis, such as sickness and death and for the health and burial insurance. Next, informal education was a great consideration. Next. Okay, um, I learned that everybody belonged to a church. I didn't say everybody was religious, but everybody belonged to a church. People saw the church as the institution that they controlled. Uh, it was a spiritual resource, a place for education, social activities. Most political meetings were held in churches. And what was impressive to me was that the cooperation was across denominational lines as well as across class lines. Next. People were organizing politically for economic parity to fight against the colonization movement, to get Baltimore City to support public schools for African-Americans and to employ African-American teachers at the same rate of pay as white teachers. They wanted patronage jobs. They wanted to serve on jury duty and the press was watching everything they did. Um, if you read this Baltimore Sun, you'll see very detailed accounts of every political meeting that was going on, who was present, what the issues were, who was elected to office. Next. And Baltimore's African-American community learned to survive through collective action because they faced so many forms of oppression, whether they were enslaved or free. So there was racial oppression, economic, the threat of forced migration, the fear of being kidnapped and re-enslaved. And as I said, they survived through collective action. And I will leave you with a Congolese proverb. And this is my last slide, Mr. Casanza. Next, it says a single bracelet does not jingle. Thank you for your attention. All right. Um, so I will, I, I know we're kind of running over on time a little bit, so I'll try and be as brief as I possibly can. And uh, thank you very much uh, for that, Donna. Um, I basically wanted to share a, a little bit about my part of this project, which was learning about how it came to be that the cemetery could be demolished. How could it be that so many people were buried there, so many important figures in Baltimore history, and how did this um, sort of tragedy um, occur? And in looking into the history in the, uh, and researching what happened in the 1950s, it turns out that um, uh, you, you could almost call it a, a conspiracy, um, a, a set of corrupt politicians conspired to demolish the cemetery in order to make profit on a land deal. Um, that's sort of the, 
quick and dirty, uh, uh, unfortunate reality of what really occurred. Um, and I wanted to just point out that um, one of the things that um, sort of set the stage for this being able to occur um, happened all the way back 100 years earlier when the cemetery was first chartered. At that time in 1852, the law that actually allowed cemeteries to um, uh, incorporate and become, um, you know, private companies, um, I have it highlighted here, it actually says that um, only seven or more free white persons may incorporate. And so, um, from the earliest inception, there was this sort of disconnect between the people who own and operated Laurel Cemetery and the African American community that was largely utilizing the cemetery. And that never really changed over the hundred years. And so ownership um, of the cemetery and of the land um, changed hands many times. Um, as uh, um, different owner operators sold their shares, new people would um, uh, come into ownership of it that had different priorities and different um, um, ideas about the way the cemetery should be operated. And throughout that time, despite numerous efforts by the descendant communities to um, acquire, to purchase, the cemetery and to take control of it, they were never actually able to do so. Um, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna be able to uh, have time to go into sort of all of the um, the, the the sort of you know a thousand cuts that led to the cemetery being um, uh, run down. But the long and the short of it is, that by the 1930s, um, it had changed hands to a real estate. Um, dealer in Baltimore, who not long after that passed away and the ownership shares passed to his colleague, uh, a real estate dealer by the name of um, John Kaufman. And Kaufman had real interest in running a cemetery. He was a real estate speculator and he was interested in it primarily for the value in the land. And so he was responsible for declaring bankruptcy uh, for the cemetery in 1952, and I know there's a lot of uh, information here on the um, on the slide here, so I'm going to try and just um, go through some of this very quickly. In 1952, he had declared bankruptcy, and this was sort of news to um, uh, this was news to the descendants. They did not realize that the cemetery was in bankruptcy. All they knew was they could no longer access it. It was fenced off and they had attempted to get in touch with Kaufman uh, many times, but were unsuccessful. This bankruptcy um, proceedings actually lasted for um, five years before they were closed. At the beginning of the bankruptcy proceedings, he apparently had 11 volumes of records of the people that were interred. And um, this sort of speaks to why Glenn's research was, oh, we technically have till 8.30? Okay, that's good to know. Um, the, the, this sort of speaks to why the research box and volunteers at the arts research is so important because at the end of the bankruptcy proceedings, these 11 volumes of records had been lost. Um, we argue that they were intentionally destroyed uh, we can't prove that, but at the beginning of the bankruptcy proceeding, Kaufman had these records. He was told to hold on to them, and um, at the end of the bankruptcy proceedings, they were lost. And um, I'll, I'll, in a little bit, I'll explain why it was beneficial for them to lose those records, but um, that's why we have no uh, existing records of who was actually buried there. So while this bankruptcy proceedings are going on, Kaufman becomes acquainted with two lawyers who worked in the Baltimore City Solicitor's Office in the real estate division, uh, Lloyd McAllister and Clement Mercado. And the three of them together kind of formulated a plan for what to do with that land. And in 1956, before the bankruptcy proceedings were officially closed, um, they formed a real estate company called McCamer Real Realty, and they were the three shareholders. And in fact, the name McCamer comes from, um, you know, the first few letters of each of their names assembled. So that's how you get this McCamer. So it's Ka John Kaufman, the real estate dealer, and the two lawyers in the city solicitor's office. 
Um, what happened also around this time in 1957 is a bill was put forward to the uh, Maryland House of Delegates for what to do with a cemetery that had been abandoned. And this is what you see over here on the right is this bill that was passed. Um, now, there's some debate um, as to exactly how involved Mercado and McAllister were in drafting this legislation. They claim that they weren't, although there's some debate um, back and forth uh, uh, about this. Um, but the long and the short of it is that this law provides that if a cemetery is 75% abandoned, then it can be declared um, uh, defunct and it can be re for other uses. And so this is where that incentive to lose those 11 volumes comes in, because in order to prove in court that it was 75% abandoned, they later went on to argue that they could not get in touch with any of the descendants. So this also explains why the descendant community that was trying to get in touch with Kaufman during this time and purchase the cemetery were so unsuccessful in getting um, uh, meetings with him is because he was uh, uh, not incentivized to, or, or had no intention of helping them preserve their uh, uh, burial ground, he was much more interested in, um, we argue, in this uh, future land deal. So this bill was passed in 1957. And um, around this time, they filed in circuit court um, to have the cemetery declared abandoned. They um, had the land appraised um, through their connections in the real estate division of the city solicitors. They had the land appraised as valueless because it was said to be a defunct cemetery, which allowed them to make an offer of $100 on the land. And here's where this um, sort of insider trading or you know corrupt dealing really starts to show itself because McCamer makes the offer on the land. Kaufman is one third owner of McCamer. They're offering $100 to the land that Kaufman himself had declared bankruptcy on. And that uh, offer was accepted at the tail end of these bankruptcy proceedings. Um, and so he was able to bankrupt the land and then the other company that he owned then purchased it for $100. Um, the other thing that uh, we, we kind of learned about what happened at this time, um, one of the things we didn't really have time to go into was the fact that about 240 USCT troops were buried at Laurel Cemetery. So these were United States colored troops that fought in the Civil War to liberate the South. And um, after the Civil War, the United States purchased a plot at Laurel Cemetery, and it was officially uh, Laurel National Cemetery for a period of time. Um, well, in the 1950s, the uh, US government still owned that plot of land. And so in order for it to be officially you know, you know, sold, in order to clear the title, um, they had to pay the US government. And here's an article on the left that reports on this. These two city solicitors actually got the Baltimore City solicitor, their boss, to pay the uh, with, with public funds to pay um, the US government to clear that title so that they could profit off of the future land deal. And so, um, you know, that's uh, uh, another example of this sort of uh, corrupt dealing that was going on. Um, so they filed this uh, action in circuit court to, to declare the land valueless. They were able to argue that um, since nobody showed up um, to um, uh, at that action because nobody knew about it, they were able to argue successfully that it was more than 75% abandoned. And then they ordered that the cemetery be closed and the dead removed. And so the uh, it was also at this time that they um, put forward the $15,000 to uh, remove the cemetery to the Carroll County um, property. And 
this was really the first when the bulldozer showed up in 1958 to remove the cemetery. This was the first time that anybody in the community knew that something was happening. They were not made aware of the court action. And um, this was a big shock uh, in the community. And so very shortly after this, um, a number of laws were filed in order to halt the um, uh, the desecration or to stop the the sale of the of the cemetery. And there were uh, notably there were three major lawsuits that two of them were sort of dismissed um, without going to trial by the um, by the um, judge. And a third um, sort of had a, a small trial, but they lost as well. And then all three of those court cases were combined into an appeal. And this was when the NAACP became involved and uh, provided lawyers for the appeal. Um, the problem that they faced was that they were able to show very clearly in court that the owners of the cemetery had defrauded essentially the descendants that they had um, uh, um, defrauded the community who was uh, uh, who had um, ancestors buried in the cemetery, but they couldn't show that they had defrauded the court. And the only thing that was at issue in the appeal was whether they had defrauded the court. And since they had had this law passed and had followed the letter of the law, um, they were unsuccessful in the court of appeals at getting it overturned. And the court of appeals didn't really look at the um, substance of the case, they just looked at the issue of whether there was fraud committed um, on the court. And so that resulted in them losing the appeal. And so in 1962, you can see here, they, uh, after the appeal was over, they began uh, leasing that land. Um, this is when they um, graded in 1962, they went back over and graded the land and they built the, at the time it was the two guys department store. Um, and actually, you know, we've gone through and looked at all of the, um, the deeds of transfer and the, and the mortgages and so forth. It's all um, sort of public record. So they leased this land for, um, I, uh, off the top of my head, I believe it was $32,000 a year for a decade and there was a provision in the lease that um, two guys department store would have the first right of purchasing the land in 10 years. And so in 1976, they sold the land to that department store and it's still the same three owners, Kaufman, Mercado, McAllister, and they sold it for $633,000 in 1976. And if you plug that into a, um, a calculator that looks at um, uh, inflation, um, that's approximately $4 million in, um, in uh, 2020 dollars. So, so these three, uh, uh, this one real estate dealer and these two uh, former city solicitors basically became millionaires on this land deal. Yeah, two guys department store is, um, uh, is what was there previously. And then later it became the Foreman Mills and, and the Food Depot that's there um, today. Um, um, again, the, the story about how it came to be demolished is, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, sort of representative of the lack of representation, the lack of a voice, the lack of political power that the descendant community and the African American community continued to have in the 1950s. And, um, uh, and, uh, I, I, you know, I was just able to sort of scratch the surface thing that went into this um, into this uh, this narrative but um, there's there's a lot more to tell and uh, that's why we're um, working on uh, putting it all into a book that is going to be coming uh, it's going to be published by Roman and Littlefield and all of us that presented here tonight are um, authoring different chapters in the book and we'll be able to lay out the the full story of everything that happened. I just wanted to leave um, off tonight with one last little um, piece of our, our research. And this is building off of um, the work that Glenn and Donna presented on and the, um, the search for uh, um, 
people who were buried at Laurel Cemetery through the death certificates. Using that database, we were able to map out um, the, the residences and the locations of people who were buried in Laurel Cemetery. And so th this database is continuing to grow and we think that this will be um, uh, uh, you know, rich for potential research in the future and, and, and looking at the development of neighborhoods and shifting demographics um, through time in Laurel Cemetery. And so each of these dots here represents um, the residence of somebody who is buried in Laurel Cemetery. And each of these is connected with all of the data that we got from the death certificate search. So just as an example here, I pulled up all of the caulkers. So the people who worked caulking boats um, and uh, you can see that they're kind of, uh, um, uh, all the red dots here represent people with that occupation. So that's one way you can access this database is by looking at occupation or looking at um, age of death or looking at um, uh, place of birth. And so, um, uh, uh, there's a lot of future work to be done, and I suppose with that, I will wrap things up, and I'll thank you all for sticking with us um, to hear this story, and um, I guess we'll open it up to questions. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Fascinating to hear about that, even though I, I, I did have some background that really illuminated a lot for me as well. Um, so we did have some questions and, and comments that came through in the chat, um, some of which kind of got addressed through the course of conversation and I'm, I'm doing my best to scroll back here. Um, I also wanna make a note that we are, we are gonna save a, a minute toward the end for our illustrious colleague, uh, Mike Franch, this being his last uh, history evening. Um, so I want to make note of that so folks don't leave quite yet. Um, there was a question about Reverend Harvey Johnson uh, and whether he attended Wayland Seminary in DC. So that might be directed toward Dr. Holly, um, who addressed Reverend Johnson. Is that uh, something you're able to answer? Yes, he was a graduate of uh, Wayland Cemetery, a uh, seminary, as was. Um, uh, William Alexander, who founded Sharon Baptist Church, they, they were both students there. Thank you. And then uh, my co-host Allison was wondering, uh, Dr. Holly, where where you got many of those photos in your slides? Were were those from uh, newspaper articles, or uh, were you able to get to the originals in some cases? Well. <laughs> Glenn helped, he gave me pictures of his ancestors. Uh, one, one of the people I spoke about, Mary Louisa Carroll, was my husband's great-great-grandmother. I didn't know until I started researching her, you know, that she was actually buried in law, but my father-in-law gave me that picture. And some of the other pictures we found online and Isaac was able to make them look really nice for me. Uh, a lot came from, um... Well, some of them came from the Library of Congress, and then also the um, AME Church has a publication that they were put out where the uh, every couple of years the bishop would talk about um, you know things going on in the congregation, and there were a lot of photos that we got from those publications. Um, so yeah. Wonderful, and I think what you alluded to as well, Dr. Holly, that you know, personal family connections, but also that that genealogical community that that you and others on this panel represent, you know, there's going through archives, but there's also kind of the personal aspect of, of gathering these materials and that that really, I think, shown through with all of these examples. Yes, I agree. All right. Well, again, I, oh, Stephen, did you want to yeah, I, I literally had uh, one qu uh, question. First off, thank you so much for addressing the, I mean, an illustrative uh, uh, presentation. Um, I, I too knew a little bit about what was going on over there, but you really guys really filled in a lot of gaps. The second part is I wanted to thank you for uh, rolling in the genealogical piece. My father um, was huge on the, in the genealogical space. And um, and there's an incredible value in uh, linking those two uh, those two worlds. The 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 
I, I'm fascinated by what you were able to find in particular around how the culture of burying African-Americans in Baltimore City. But in like in my past, I just have not seen a whole lot of black spaces. You know, like what happened to all the black people who were buried in, I mean, have you seen that? Or, you know, you have any background on uh, um, black people were here for hundreds of years. Where are they buried? Well, they, they had used part of what became Laurel as a burial ground as well for both free black um, servants and slaves of local plantations. So the hill had been used, it was called Laurel Hill, and it had been used before the cemetery was, was created as a burial ground. But the, the, the great masses of folk oh, who couldn't, yes. yeah, the great masses of folk who could not afford a plot. What did Baltimore, like, you know, do we know what happened well, to them? Yeah. Well, there's, there's two, there's at least two what they call poppers graves um, in Western Baltimore. It's unclear um, exactly uh, how many people were buried there, but um, Donna, were you going to jump in there? I just wanted to say that Sharp Street Church had its own cemetery. Mm -hmm. There were also, um, I can't recall the name right now, but there were Catholic cemeteries as well. So Laurel is the first non-denominational cemetery, but there were others where people were buried throughout the city. But, and that's also what makes the demolition of Laurel such a tragedy and also such an outrage, is that this was a massive place for the commemoration of that that community. And some of the records that we found, um, you know, talk about um, spending a year to raise money to put up a memorial to, to Daniel Payne, for example. And, you know, we found, um, you know, the, the um, oration records from erecting that memorial and how important it was to the community and thousands of people showing up for decoration a day. And so um, the fact that the cemetery was discarded through this um, or, or demolished through this sort of corporate uh, uh, or this, um, uh, you know, action in the 1950s was is a real detriment and it's a real tragedy to to the community today that we argue. And that's why I think it's so important to spread the message and to erect a memorial there. It's sort of the least we could do. Yes. I want yeah, to add on that. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dr. Kluge. Just, just quick on just an addendum on that. There were some a couple, few smaller church-based cemeteries closer in at the, like the original church sites that were just, um, lost as the city expanded. So it's just an interesting side note that Laurel Cemetery was the site of for reinterment of bodies from some of these cemeteries that were lost due to urban expansion back as far as the 1880s. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the, your your answers. The reason I ask that question is because you look at census records, and the census records don't match what we know about burial sites, right? And uh, I often wonder, you know, like, well, where's the gap? But thank you so much for your answers. I appreciate it. And I'll I'll reiterate that there's um, you know information about the project in the chat as well as contact information, at least for. Uh, Glenn Blackwell, and certainly if anybody wants to follow up, we can we can help connect um, with the various folks here. So, and I think on our website we have we have uh, more contact information as well. Awesome. Go ahead, Mike. No, not yeah. Question about this. I was really thrilled to see on your your geo plotting there uh, uh, a whole cluster of people from my neighborhood Waverly who are buried there, and I'm going to have to look into that. Yeah, that was really neat to see. You could see them lined up along Greenmont Avenue there, north of 33rd Street. Uh, I'm basically a 19th century person, and so I was just wondering, I, I have my great interest in the front end of this, uh, and I noticed amongst the, uh, the founders, uh, the white incorporators, was uh, John McJelton, who was uh, an Episcopal priest, uh, first Baltimore school superintendent uh, who lost his job after the Civil War when he, you know, tried to get the city to start schools for African Americans. And so I wonder if you have, you know, kind of any idea about 
it seems to me some of the people involved in the very beginning were not simply people working on a business deal. And if you've, I've wondered if you've uncovered any information about that. That's a, that's really interesting to know. And, and you're absolutely right. Uh, at the beginning, it's clear that there was cooperation between the incorporators and what was the executive committee um, who couldn't have uh, um, owning shares in the in the cemetery and that that sort of cooperative um, foundation sort of withered away over time. Um, I, I didn't know that about um, McJilton, but maybe Dr. Papenfuse knew that. Um, but that's good to know and something to follow up on for sure. Thank you. Well, if we don't have any more questions, um, we did we did want to cede the floor to Mike again, and I'll I'll, I'll be the first to say that, um, you know, for years, and I don't know how many years, Mike, I'll let you say, um, have really been um, steering this effort to bring these public talks. Of course, formerly in person, now often Zoom, but really steering that effort and, and doing an incredible job bringing me and others into the fold. So. Um, I'll let Mike say a few words, but we want to thank him for all his years of service, um, particularly to this committee, but for so much he's done for Baltimore City's history and, and the society. Well, well, thank you very much. I, I, I appreciate your kind words, David. One of the great things that's happened in the last two years is David Armente and Savannah Woods have come aboard uh, on the Baltimore History Evening Committee. Um, I started this series in 2009. So that means this is, I guess, as I count on my fingers, the uh, 14th season that we've we've done this. Uh, and uh, it's really covered from the very first evening, which was uh, Dr. Tom Cripps, who talked about confessions of a Baltimore lifer. And many of you know Tom and his important role of years of teaching at Morgan and his role in African-American uh, um, film industry but the from the very beginning this has been you know not about me as the chair but about you all as the cooperative community of historians and audience uh, this was viewed from the very beginning as kind of a marketplace where you could get people who who had something to say about baltimore history together with people who were interested in baltimore history at whatever their level. The idea was to have a high quality presentation such as we had tonight, but that would be interesting and presented in a way that could gather a broad general audience that we could break beyond the people who thought of themselves as historians or sorry, anthropologists and archeologists. We initially just were thinking of historians and you know, historians are like puppies who are paper trained. And so it's it's good to, to see folks who are, you know, out there digging in the dirt. And and, and we've had now two presentations this year of uh, about archaeology, which has been wonderful. Uh, but in any event, my, my, my point here, though, is that this is a cooperative endeavor between the, the historical community, using that word historical broadly, uh, and the, uh, the people who, 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 who did the writing and the people who do the listening. And we need each other. Those of us who research need people who are interested in hearing what we do. Those of us who are interested in Baltimore history need to hear the work that, uh, you know, the words of the people who are doing the work. So I would, just in my final words, I, I, I think one of the important things that people do who or active in organizations is make room for others. And it's time for me to make room for new people and um, also maybe get some of more of my own work done. So uh, there will be more Baltimore History Evenings. And uh, I just wanted to, to close by, you know, it's not a focus on me, it's a focus on you. Thank you. I know some of the names I see on the screen here have been supporters for all these years, turned up at the Village Learning Place turned up when we went to Zoom. You are the folks that carry Baltimore history forward into the future. And uh, I just thank you very much for being part of this, for me, this 14 year trip of 
of exploring together Baltimore history. Thank you very much. David. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, and everybody for joining us this evening, all the representatives from the Laurel Cemetery Project. Um, hope you all have a nice evening. Thank, Thank you, you very much for having us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good Mike, night, everyone. For making the space. Thank you very much. And if anyone Thank has suggestions so for next year, just <laughs> let Thank David know. David. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Have a great evening. Take care.